Yesterday, I am so sorry that I missed your birthday. Happy birthday, Eduardo. This is Eduardo. Let's embarrass Eduardo. Eduardo is always in the back. Can we get a spotlight on Eduardo? Can we get him on camera? Eduardo, happy birthday. We love you, man. Eduardo has been such a blessing. Many of you don't know him. You know Felipe and Ezra, but Eduardo's our technical director at our church. And uh, how long have you worked here now? Five years? Four years. Five years. He's been such a blessing to our team. And, um, and uh, so happy day after your birthday. I'm sorry that I missed it. All right, unsettled, part three. Unsettled. Time to get unsettled about the right things and get settled about the right things. Amen? Last week we talked about being content but not resigned. Amen. We're content. What does it mean to be content? We're going to put it up on the screens. Content means that you have peace of mind and you have mental and emotional satisfaction. So many people live discontent, right? They're just not happy. They're not satisfied. Nothing's ever good enough. How many of you know those people? Right? Nothing's ever good enough. No matter how much money, no matter, no, no matter how many drugs, no matter how many, much alcohol, no matter how much sex, no matter what job they get, they get promoted, still not good enough. No matter how many friends they have, no matter what's going on in the government, it's never, never good enough. They're just dissatisfied. How many of you know it's not about all those things? It's an issue in their heart. Right? It's an issue in their heart. It's in their mind. It's in their heart. They're discontent. And it produces poison in your life. Being content is not ruled by things. It's not ruled by things. <clears throat> but you know what else being content is? It's not resigning. It's not quitting. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, we're going to put it on the screens. He said, I've learned in whatever state I am to be content to have peace, to have mental and emotional satisfaction. I know how to be a base and I know how to abound. You know, it's easy to know how to abound. It's not so easy to know how to base, right? Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ. Who is the source of your peace? Jesus Christ. He is what? The Prince of Peace. And His peace is tranquility of your heart and mind. It is living with a divine sense of favor. How many of you remember the missing peace teaching that I just did? How about we do this? How about if you want the missing peace teaching tonight, I'll give it to you for 80% off in the bookstore. How about that? You can go give it, get it for like a very few dollars. So that's great. Someone tell the bookstore I said that. They're going to freak out right now but because you're going to all go buy it and they're not going to know what to do with themselves. If they run out, don't be mad at them. I did not tell them about this ahead of time. You can pay for it and you can pick it up on Sunday. All right. Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he gives you tranquility in your heart and mind. He allows you to live with a divine sense of favor. His peace produces health, welfare, prosperity and every kind of what? Good in your life. He is the source of all blessing. But you have to learn how to be content. How many of you know there are seasons in life, right? There are seasons where maybe not even in all of your life, but certain areas of your life, you might be abased or empty or your hand may be empty. And there are other seasons where you may be abounding, right? It happens in the world, in the economy. Right now we're abounding. Seven years ago we were abased. Remember when the stock market crashed? That was a basement. And all you heard was, all day was, well, in this economy, remember that? <clears throat> Tonight, new topic. Lack and abundance. Lack and abundance. I wonder how you view lack and abundance with God. I wonder how you view it. How do you view lack as the will of God or not? How do you view abundance? I wonder what you think of overflow. 
I wonder what you think of being abased. Paul said that he learned to be content in both. How did he do that? Because he realized that life isn't about things. Many of you came into this church where on paper your life was abounding, but in your heart you were abased. Right? Many of you came into this church where on paper your life was empty, but in your heart you had satisfaction. Some of the wealthiest people I know are the most miserable. A lot of the counseling I do with people who are battling depression, in every area of their life, there is no reason why they should be depressed. There's a, they have amazing jobs. They have more money than they know what to do with. They have spouses that love them. They have children that are healthy. They've got great cars, great houses. They take great trips, and yet they're still lonely. They're still angry. They're discontent. And that's something. See, peace of mind and being content is not about money. It's not about things. The Bible has a lot to say about lack, abundance, overflow, need. It's got a lot to say about it. Very rarely is it talking about money. Now, in times, it's talking about money. <clears throat> Everybody's all quiet, right, because I'm talking about money. Like, that's, it, in the church world, you don't talk about eating healthy and money. <laughs> and in some churches, you don't talk about sin. But in our church, we talk about all three. You want to know why? Because as your pastor, it is our responsibility to talk to you even about the things that are uncomfortable. Yeah. And we do it because we love you and we respect you and we want you to live in the fullness of God's calling on your life. Amen. Amen. I wonder what you view, how you view God. Do you view him as the one who wants to supply for you or do you view him as wanting you to go through lack? It's interesting in Psalms 23, it's a very famous scripture, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the literal text, that word want means to deplete, to deplenish, and to cause to lack. Now you know the context of what this is written in. What did David go on to say? And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So he says, I shall not want even in the valley of death. Hello. Now, what a mental state to get to. Am I right? That even when death is staring me in the face, I'm in a season of being abased, as Paul called it. Maybe things aren't working out so great. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. David said, I will not be de depleted, I will not diminish, and I will not enter into lack. This was not a reality in the moment. What it was was a confession of faith. Amen? He goes on to say, later on in the scripture, my cup runneth over. In the valley, he declares, my cup runneth over. That phrase literally means to saturate and to bring abundance into your life. So in the valley, man, most historians think that he wrote this psalm walking down, staring at Goliath. Literally staring death in the face. And he says, I'm good. You know what I think David was saying? My situation's not good, but I'm good. You know what I think he was saying is? My situation's not great, 
but my God is great. You know what I think he was saying? There's death, but I got something greater to offer it. I can bring life to this. Why? Because the greater one is with me. See, what is your attitude towards the situation? See, if you find being content, being at peace with things, you will always have discontent in your life. But when you find your contentment, your peace in Jesus, you will not be ruled by the situation. And even when death is staring you in the face, you will look at the situation and say, I've got something to offer this. My God is greater than this situation. Oh, I may be in this season, but yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David didn't say, oh, I'm going to go sit down in the valley. Oh, woe is me. The valley. I'm here again. Why didn't you just leave me in the field with the sheep, Lord? God. Do you think he would have taken a selfie in the valley if he could have? <laughs> hashtag valley of death. Half, hashtag it's pretty dark here. Hashtag not too happy about it. Hashtag God is greater though. Hashtag turning things around. <laughs> my hashtag game is so strong when I'm preaching. It's not on my Instagram. <laughs> you don't pitch your tent in the valley, man. Does it sound like he was having a pity party? No, he spoke to the lack and declared abundance. Even in the valley. But if you are determined to find your peace in things, you will always be without peace. Your peace is found in him. Amen? Amen. That's good stuff, right? Let me just tell you this. It is 100% not the will of God for you to live in lack. It's 100% not the will of God. Let me take it one step further. You don't have time for it. You can't afford it. Listen to what I just said to you. You can't afford to live in lack. Okay. Now let's all settle this. Lack is so much more than your money. To be honest with you, it's got very little to do with your money. Lack is like generosity. There's a stereotype that it's all about your money. It ain't about your money. Sometimes it's about your money. I saw a guy the other day, a homeless man, someone who had given me some money at church. I gave him the money. That's generosity. Like, I didn't wake up with that money in the morning. Someone who gave it to me at church, I gave it to the homeless guy. I didn't have my budget based on that. Why can't I just be generous with my money? I just gave it to him. It's far more need. He needed it way more than I did. But, you know, generosity is way more than that. Generosity is about your forgiveness. Generosity is about your love. Generosity is about your helping hand. Generosity is about just being nice. Generosity is not about not getting into petty, stupid arguments with people. Generosity is about going to work and doing a good job. Hello. So is lack. You know, let me just talk about myself, okay? And I'm not trying to sound self-serving, okay? But I've got a hundred and I think a hundred and fifty-four, I think, employees that respond directly to Shannon and I. A lot of you didn't realize the church was that big, huh? Hundred and I think it's 150, 154. <clears throat> we have I think four thousand volunteers, and I just got the attendance report last week. On average, during the week, uh, from Sunday, Wednesday, men, women, children—you know—we count the cockroaches and everything. If it breathes, <laughs> if it breathes, it counts at, at Abundant Living. I mean, like. I actually pray for little ant farms. I'm like, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven. Record attendance today, baby. Just kidding. 
but our church on average, uh, average week now is running about 20,000 people between the two campuses. Yeah, praise the Lord. But let me, I, I don't say that to brag. You can glorify God, okay? But I just say it, listen. I don't have time to live in lack. And I, I say, listen to what I'm saying, okay? I don't have time to live in lack of judgment. You know what I'm saying? I don't have time to, to have lack of judgment with women. I'm a married man and a pastor. I don't have time to have lack of creative ideas. See, you showed up tonight expecting me, rightfully so, to minister to you. I don't have time to live in lack of wisdom. I don't have time to live in lack of solutions. I don't have time to live in lack of ideas. Lack isn't about money. Lack is about God's supply going in and through your life. And I don't have time for it, and neither do you. You are called as a child of God to glorify the goodness of God. And the way you glorify the goodness of God is that you live in the provision of God. And you walk in His supply on your life. You moms and dads, you don't have time to live in lack of, of wisdom with your children. You need to be making wise decisions. You don't have time to live in lack of judgment. You can't afford for your wife to walk in and you're looking at the wrong stuff on the computer. You don't have time for it. You don't have time to slip back into to drinking and you get busted one night by the cops. You don't have time, you don't have room for that in your life. Do you hear what I'm saying? We are the children of God. And God said, God has declared that lack is not for you. Abundance is for you. Let me prove it to you. So let me say all that. I say all that so that you will not settle for lack. Don't settle for it. So let's let, look at the truth about lack and overflow. Number one, overflow is God's will for you. Lack is not. Now, I am just going to overwhelm you with scripture tonight. I'm just going to overwhelm you. Because I know that in Christianity, there is this thing that God wants you to have lack, or God will send you through a season, or God wants you to be poor, you know, there's that teaching around. So I'm not going to try to teach. I'm just going to show you the Bible. I'll let God speak for himself. Okay? Okay. John 10, 10. For I have come that you may have life and have it what? More abundantly. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. To destroy what? The abundant life. Right? Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what? All, not some, all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace his Undeserved, unmerited favor, his divine empowerment abound toward you. Does that include you? Amen. That you always. Does always mean always? Boy, I am so smart, right? Golly. Wow, I mean, I'm a deep preacher today. <laughs> Guys, always means always. That's why you're here. Always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. Exceedingly great, exceedingly precious Promises, over 7,000 of them. James 1 verse 5 says, For any of you, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, 
who gives it to all, to who? All, all liberally and without reproach. It means he doesn't hold it back. So if you are lacking wisdom, if you will simply ask him, he will pour it out onto you liberally. God's word blatantly shows us a God of overflow. God wants you to live in overflow. The devil wants you to live in lack. God says you're the head. The devil wants you to be the tail. God declared you that you are above. The devil wants you to be beneath. And what makes you beneath? Lack. God said you declare that everything you set your hand to do will what? Prosper. Prosper prosperity is the opposite of lack. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy your abundance. It is God's will for you 100% for you to live in abundance. Why am I going after this so much? Because I need to beat the lack mentality out of your heart and mind. You are not called to live in lack in any area of your life. In any area. Spirit, soul, body, you are not called to live in lack. You are called by God to live in abundance. Number two, overflow is, a, is God's ability on display. Let's go back to a couple of those same scriptures. Ephesians 3 verse 20. Now to him who is what? Able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything you've ever asked or dreamed. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you in all things that you may have abundant, abundance. See, overflow is a great dis demonstration of God's grace and ability working in and through your life. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. It says, my grace my empowerment, my favor is what? Sufficient for you. My strength. Whose strength? God's strength. And you can do all things through Christ who gives you what? Strength. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Our entire purpose in life as Christians is to glorify God's grace. And we do it by accepting that his promise for us is to live in abundance. And we reject the idea of poverty, of lack, in any area of our life, even when we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. What did David say? I will not be caused to lack. My cup runneth over. Why? Because we decide that we are not ruled by things, we are ruled by the promises of God. Those great and precious promises have been declared yes and amen for your life. Number three, overflow is the spirit of God's kingdom. And let me tell you this, and you have no need to apologize for it. Overflow is the spirit of of God's kingdom. Well, I'll prove it to you even in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 31 verse 5. It said, The children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine, oil and honey, and of all the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. What does Matthew 33, uh, 6, 33 say? Seek ye first the advancement of God's kingdom. The Bible says that there will be seed time and what? Harvest. That the world of the generous will do what? Get bigger and bigger. It says give and it will be what? Given unto you. The spirit of the kingdom of God is that you advance the kingdom and God builds your life. It does not say that he will withhold from you. So let me ask you a question. Is your spirit in line with God's? Is your spirit in line with God's spirit? Have you chosen the kingdom of God as your priority? Have you chosen generosity 
and abundance as your priority? Or have you settled for lack? Number four, abundance and overflow has its proper place. It has its proper place. Abundance is not about greed. It is not about selfishness. It is not about vanity. And that is exactly where Christianity goes wrong. That's where it goes wrong. That's where it goes wrong in the world. There's abundance in the world. I mean, all you got to do is pay attention. There's abundance. But when abundance becomes about me, it goes wrong. Abundance from God to us is put on the earth to bless us, but also to be a blessing. Genesis 12, verse 2, I will make your name great. I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. He wants your name to be great. He wants you to be blessed. He wants to supply all your need, but it has its proper place. It is for you, but it is also for the kingdom of God. It is to glorify God, and it is to be a blessing with people around you. That's why I told you that story about this last Sunday when someone had given me money, and I just gave it along. You can be a cynic. Oh, what if he bought alcohol? Well, what if he didn't? What if he did it? And you who has a house and drives a new car and goes home and has a glass of wine, you're judging a homeless guy for buying beer? Get off your high horse, homie. If you were living under a bridge on the freeway, you'd probably buy beer too. (laughs) Gee whiz, man. (laughs) Come on, man. It's got its proper place, man, to be a blessing. That's what it's all about. You glad you came to church so far? Number five, a godly life produces abundance. Ah, so here we go. A godly life produces abundance. Let me show it to you in the words. Psalms 34, 9 through 10. Fear the Lord. You, his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Ah, so what does it mean to fear him? Well, if you've come to this church for a while, you know that fear is not like, ah, I'm scared of God. No, God's on your side. He's not out to get you. Okay, fear in the Bible means living your life with a deep and reverential sense of accountability to God. Let's just put it in English terms. You live like God wants you to live. You go act like the Christian you're supposed to act like. Christian. Christ in me. Christian. Christ in me. You live your life as if Christ is in you. What does that mean? That means when someone cuts you off, you don't flip, flip them off. <laughs> That means you don't look at the naked chicks on the internet. That means you don't yell and scream at your husband because he didn't do what you wanted him to do when you wanted him to do it, even though you didn't tell him what you wanted to do or when you wanted him to do it. And all the fellas said, it means when a friend of yours messes up, You don't mock them and make fun of them. You go help them stand back up. Being a Christian means that you forgive people who have hurt you even if they haven't asked for it. See, being a Christian means that you give people favor even when it's not deserved. See, being a Christian means that you slow down and wait and open the door for an elderly person who may be 15, 20 steps behind you, and God forbid you have to hold on for 30 seconds out of your busy life. See, that's being a Christian. Being a Christian means you get down on your knees at night and pray for your country instead of talking about how much you hate it. What if we spent 10% of the time 
praying for the president and Congress than we do talking trash about them. See, that's Christianity. Christianity loves their neighbor. Christianity goes the extra mile. Christianity serves. Christianity loves even when others hate. Christianity doesn't judge off stereotypes. Christianity doesn't see color. Christianity sees a child of God, not a race or skin. That's Christ in me. Whew. We're having all this fun, and then it goes serious. You just live your life with a deep reverential sense of accountability. Can I just tell you something? At the end of the day, you can talk about the love of God. You can talk about faith in God. You can talk about God's grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his peace. But can I tell you something? There is still no substitute in life for you just doing what God tells you to do. For you obeying what he tells you to do in his word. The Bible says be a doer of the word. Church, let me tell you this. If you want God's results, you need to do it God's way. Period. Which means we say no to sin. We keep our relationships pure. Oh, this is Wednesday night. I'm going to just take that extra mile, that extra step. Y'all unmarried people, you need to have pure relationships. Which means you say no to having sex until you get married. And some of y'all have already started and you're going to stop tonight because you're going to have a godly relationship. All the married people are eight minutes. Yeah, man, you told them, Pastor. You tell those kids, those millennials. For real, though, your relationships are messed up because they're based on sex. They're not based on getting to know each other. God knows what he was doing. Stop having sex. Get to know each other. And then you'll know if the relationship's right. And then when you get married, it'll be a lot of fun. Come on, man. If you want God's results, you still got to do it God's way. You got to do it God's way. I know I'm, I'm repeating, but if you want God's results, God, we come in here and, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. And then he's speaking to you and you're going, whoop, no, whoop, no, whoop, no. I want to do that. No, no, Lord. I need you to heal my body. He's like, the doctor already told you what to do, and you haven't done it. <laughs> Y'all liked me when I was giving away the free cups and all that, huh? They liked it. And now it's like, where's Charles? Is Charles, where is he on the west side or what? what what's up? What's up? No, but for real. The doctor tells you, you need to stop eating like that. You need to eat like this. You keep eating like that, but then you're coming into church going, God, heal me. <laughs> I can just picture Jesus up there on the throne going, I'm trying. <laughs> you need to try too. Somebody could go throw those donuts away tonight. <laughs> like, oh, Pastor Jared. <laughs> You're welcome. Number six, overflow is a giver of life. And lack is a killer. Overflow gives life. Lack produces death. Job 4.11, it says the lion perishes for lack of prey. Job 36.12, they die for lack of understanding. Proverbs 10, 21 says, fools die for lack of judgment, for lack of wisdom. 
Proverbs eleven fourteen. For lack of guidance, a nation will fall. Hell low. Where there is no counsel, the people perish. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. What's the theme here? Lack produces death. Lack is a killer and God is a life giver. I have come that you may have life and have it what? More abundantly. Abundant living faith center. Lack is not from God. It is not from God. Lack is put on this earth to kill your dreams, to kill your hope, to kill your possibilities, to rob you of your passion, to rob you of your desire, to rob you of your peace. Lack is a killer. But lack is not of God. And greater is Jesus Christ than any lack that the enemy could try to bring in your life. Did you know that it is estimated that today there are 795 million people who have no nutrition? There's only 9 billion people on the planet. So that's one out of every nine people on the planet have no nutrition. Can I tell you something? That's why we have a food pantry. That's why we're bringing back Project Love El Paso this year. We're going to do these huge outreaches this summer. I know I can't feed every person, but, I mean, we can feed some of them. Like, this year we're not do last year we did 800 backpacks and shoes. This year we're doing 1,200. I mean, like, I mean, but can I tell you something? Okay, let me just tell you, you can't have a food pantry if there's no abundance. See what I'm saying? You can't give backpacks if there's no abundance. You can't go to these elderly centers that we're going to go to in June and July and take them their basic necessities that the leadership is telling us that they need. These poor elderly people don't have toothbrushes. They don't have toothpaste. They don't have deodorant. They don't have shampoo to wash their hair, man. Can you imagine? You get in your 70s and 80s, you, don't, you can't wash your hair? That's not right. But you can't go if you're in lack. You see what I'm saying? And God says we're here to help people like that. To feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to be a blessing. You can't be a blessing if you have no blessing. Amen? Stand to your feet. Let's overcome lack. Let's overcome it. Let's not settle for it. You don't have time for it. And beyond that, it's not God's will for you. God doesn't want you to live that way. He wants you to live in abundance. He wants you to live in peace. He wants to give you creative ideas and solutions. He wants you to have the wisdom to go solve the problem for your boss. You, not the other guy, you. You are the head and not the tail. You're the child of God. He wants to give you the kids that love Jesus. He wants to give you the next preacher, the next doctor. How come your kids can't be the one that changes our city? How come your kids can't discover the cure for cancer? Why has it got to be somebody else? Why has it got to be Houston and Dallas and San Antonio? Why can't it be El Paso? God's promises are greater for them. We got to break out of this poverty mentality. Stop it. We are the children of the Most High God. So say no to lack. Reject it. Say no to it. And start declaring, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, my cup runs over. I shall not want. The Lord is with me. Come on, lift your hands. Go ahead.